Aloha, my name is Tara Coyote. Hi, I'm Ted Cheeseman. And we're here to have a conversation about whales. So just a little bit of info before we begin. I recently came out with this lovely children's ocean conservation book, Kaimana the Hawaiian Mermaid. And this is actually my dear brother. And since I wrote this book about ocean conservation featuring a Hawaiian mermaid, which is based on a true story of a sperm whale washing up on the coast of Kauai this past January, 2022, um, I was inspired to share about my love of the ocean and being a mermaid. And my brother runs a wonderful organization called Happy Whale. And so I thought I'd collaborate and put some of the funds that this book creates and feed it to Happy Whale to help promote awareness about Happy Whale and whales in general. So I am here visiting California and I was inspired to interview my lovely brother here. So thank you for joining me. Pleasure. <laughs> uh, Happy Whale has been in the news quite frequently. So I'm so excited to share this message on a larger scale. So first of all, please share us in brief what Happy Whale is. So Happy Whale is, well, it's a web site, web platform. Um, it's a research collaboration and citizen science web platform. The idea being that every whale is an individual, each one, just like a we're individuals. Every whale is a unique creature, every animal is. And we can tell individuals apart with humpback whales, which is our main focus species, but we also study sperm whales and other species as well. Uh, with humpback whales, when they dive, they usually lift their tails. And when they lift their tails, you can see individually identifiable features. So what we do is we built this web platform so that people that take pictures of whales, when they dive, they can send the picture of the whale to Happy Whale. And we'll tell you who that whale is. We actually use artificial intelligence a machine learning based image recognition algorithm to identify the whale and then say, okay, pulling from our database, what do we know about that whale? And some of these whales we've known for, there's a whale in there that we've known for over 50 years, a whale that's older than, than you and I are. <laughs> and so then you get to follow your whale, which to us is really special because one, it's great data for science. Like it's really, really powerful to follow an individual and even follow whole populations of whales. Like we know almost every whale in the North Pacific Ocean, here along the California coast, all the way to Russia, to Alaska, down to Mexico, over to Hawaii. We know almost every whale. But also, it's super cool to be able to follow your whale. Like if you go out whale watching and you see a whale, it it's, you know, that whale is beautiful, but then you get to know that individual. And we believe that following, connecting people to one whale connects them with the whole ocean. I love that. Do they have names? So if I... Some do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I actually had to name one today. I don't name many whales because I kind of feel like that's it's for others to do. But I was going through some pictures and there was this whale with this like big smiley face on its <laughs> tail. So they have scars and they have patterns and they have pigmentation. So they'll, the pigmentation is like natural, you know, features, right? But then also they might get barnacle scars or scrapes or sometimes kill a whale attack scars and that kind of thing. And sometimes they kind of make pictures or that, you know, you can see. And so this one tail, it had like a big smiley face mark on it. And it looked like the tail of a seal oh. that would, or it looked like the face of a seal. So I had to name the whale Happy Seal. <laughs> um, Happy Seal. But uh, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. The, a lot of them have names and there's a long tradition of naming whales. Some naturalists and researchers have done this for a long time. And so our innovation wasn't so much like being able to recognize the whale, it was our innovation has been the automated Im image recognition, the artificial intelligence, and then building a website around it so that we could gather all the photos in the world, rather than it just being like, oh, here's the catalog for Northern California. 
and here's the catalog for Eastern Australia, and here's another catalog for Eastern Australia because two different researchers don't have the time or money to figure out which whales are which and that sort of thing. Now we just bring They're it all together. together. And so yeah, there's there's whales that have more than one name, but then there's there's like over 90,000 whales in this database at this point. That's so amazing. there's a lot of whales that don't have names that probably need, probably deserve names. It's a lot of names to think of too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Wow, okay. And so what inspired you to start Happy Well? So, well, the specific story, I mean, the inspiration was for a lot. So I, I, I'm a scientist now, full time, but most of my career has been um, guiding nature safaris and organizing expeditions, and particularly to Antarctica, which is this far away place, very difficult place, but just such an incredibly beautiful place. And we started traveling down there when almost nobody ever went to Antarctica. And the amazing thing was back then in the early 90s, you didn't see, there just weren't many whales. The history here is quite a sad one. Industrial whaling last century took out almost all the whales. Almost all of them, 99%, 95% depends on the species, depends on the ocean, but almost all of them. The happy part is that they've been recovering. So when we started going to, and, and that's a generalization, not all populations and not all species, but many of the large whale species have been recovering. So when we started going to Antarctica, we almost saw no whales. But then through the 2000s, we started seeing more whales. And as a naturalist and a guide, I wanted to tell my travelers about these whales, but I didn't have a lot of information. And we'd photograph these whales and I had a, a kind of a funny story. I, it was the 2004, first year I took a digital camera to Antarctica. And then it was such a cool thing. Like right now we take it for granted, right? Record a video, play it back, take a picture. Oh, look at it. Of course, it's so easy. But then it was such an amazing thing to be able to take a picture and look at it like right then, right? Yeah. So I took a picture of this whale. We were, we were in a place called the Bransfield Strait, which is just the very northern stretch of Antarctica, just outside of uh, actually an active volcano called Deception Island. Encountered some whales and this one dove and I photographed it. And um, I was looking at this picture and it had these scrape marks on its tail, which are from an attack by a killer whale. I didn't really know this then, but I now know that almost all of that happens when it's a calf and the whales survive, right? It gets attacked by killer whales. A whole pot of killer whales would have been holding onto it, trying to hold it down. But, you know, mom probably fought them off and the calf pulled away and it had these marks on its tail that stayed the rest of its life. So I was looking at it like, oh, look, this whale survived a killer whale attack. And I was showing it to people and our guests and said, Three days later, I went into the, um, the men's bathroom at Palmer Station, which is the U.S. Antarctic base down south of there on Anvers Island. And, um, and there on the wall is this beautiful photograph of the same whale. And I'm oh like, gosh. well, I know that whale. You know, I just oh. recognized it because I'd been staring at it. Be like looking at a face and a picture and then you see the person walking down the road. Then a few days later, oh, I know that person. Right. So there I was and it was... You know, I, I ran out and I got my camera, I took it back into the bathroom because it was like, oh, look, that same whale. Isn't that remarkable? But to me, it was kind of this, there was the two points there, which is that there was a story in these pictures and I didn't really have the story, right? I knew I could tell where the whale was in that photo because quite a scenic spot. It was in the Gerlach Strait, um, but um, which is an area in Antarctica that I know quite well. But, um, and I knew my photo, but like, what else, right? Here's the same whale seen in two places, but there's more story in there. And also there's a sign, there was science in there. You know, it's, it's like, there's these two data points, the same whale seen in different places at different dates. And I wanted that to be available to science. And I wanted, you know, here we were traveling to these places that is really expensive to take a research voyage to. And we as tourists and tour guides could contribute to science 
when we replace the research voyages but that idea of could we build a bridge between the science and the and the tourists and the public and the citizen scientists and the interested people and have both benefit from it that was really the inspiration for it, it took over 10 years to even start it was just kind of an idea then and then 10 years later i'm like okay we're doing this so you started in 2000 the idea 14. started in the early 2000s and okay. then the um yeah and then actually building the website started in 2014 and then the website started in 2015 um and yeah it's been gosh eight years now wow. and eight and a half years and um it's been you know just growing yeah very inspiring yeah good to hear the story and for those of you who don't know, our parents led wildlife safaris around the globe. We grew up very fortunate. We have traveled to lots of exotic places. It's called Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris. It's still running. You can find it. But um, when he's referring to going to Antarctica, it's on a, one of our family trips. Yeah. 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 Mom and Dad. Incredible inspirations. It's really cool. Actually, I no longer own the company actually as of quite recently some a long time guide a fellow that scott davis who's been guiding for us for us who was guiding for the company that i used to own um for 15 years i think he has taken it over with his partner and they are really in many ways have the spirit of mom and, mom and dad But yeah, I mean, it was, you know, when I was 10 years, 10, 11, and you were 15, 14, you were 14, I was 11. Dad went to Antarctica for the first time as a guide for another company. And then mom and dad both went in 1992. For a different company on three different trips. And on that trip, they said, oh, let's do it ourselves. And they had started their company, of course, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But on that trip, that second trip, that 1992 trip, they said, we can do this ourselves. And it was such a massive endeavor to charter a ship. I mean, this, you know, 100 passengers and, you know, the cost of the ship for the 25 days that we chartered it was worth more than our house was. And like, oh, my God, are we going to fill it up? What if we don't get enough people? But it was such an incredible time. Super stressful, but then super wonderful. And yeah, we went on and did it. So I've worked down there almost, almost every year for about 30 years now. Amazing. And, um, and it's definitely formed and molded the way I look at this and sharing and environmentalism and saving the ocean and knowing about the ocean and, and certainly the science guiding this. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's pretty incredible to see him combining the whole tour <laughs> aspect and the information with the science too. Yeah. So That's I funny. commend you for that. Our parents sadly died in the last few years. So when we're talking about them in past tense, that's why. So we'll talk about that more later on. Um, so, uh, why are whales so special? We have these beautiful photos as a sperm whale. Those are beautiful! But they're not just, be I'm okay. So I think that whales, all life has intrinsic value. I think that there's beauty there. I think that they're, you know, there's, there's no, we don't have to justify their existence. They're just beautiful, but, but, we also should recognize that they have quite a lot of other values to us. Whales are a, a, a important part of healthy oceans and healthy oceans are an important part of our lives and society and economy. I mean, we get mm -hmm. so much from the ocean, right? And part of that is fish and part of that is I mean, now we're tired, starting to, you know, build wind power farms in the ocean and we're building, you know, there's, there, there are so many things that we take from the ocean. The truth is that we can continue taking from the ocean more sustainably, more effectively, more profitably if the oceans are healthy. And so kind of, there's a, 
I'll make it brief, but there's a crazy story about whales in Antarctica, which is that in the Antarctic, that's, and, and the ocean around Antarctica is where most whales live in the world. There were, last century, about three million whales killed by whaling. Okay. I don't really want to dwell on the depressing parts about whaling. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the reality. We took them out as industrial products, like just turn them into margarine and things like this, which is kind of crazy. What sort of, I mean, I know lots of body parts were used, but they were soap. Mostly they're fat. Right, right. I mean, whales have these huge layers of blubber around them. Right. You know, we think like, oh, watch your weight. Well, a healthy whale is a fat whale. When you see a fat whale, you're like, mm, that's, that's a healthy whale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and a, a mother whale will get pregnant and then will carry her baby to term or not, depending on how healthy she is, how fat she is. Does right. she have enough energy? Because especially like humpback whales here, that's a sperm whale, that's a, that's a humpback whale. Humpback whales breed in warm waters, but they feed in cold waters at higher latitudes. So here in California, up in Alaska, off of Russia, off of Norway, and off of uh, the east coast of the US, off of Canada, that's where they're feeding off of Antarctica. And then they go towards the tropics and they breed there. So they are carrying all the energy with them. And the crazy thing about that is in doing that, they, they, they are basically a big part of the mechanics of the way the oceans work. And getting back to the story that I started to tell. So in Antarctica, when there were probably 2 million whales living in the oceans around Antarctica, there is, you know, think about how much stuff it takes to feed two million whales. Each of these whales might be eating literally 10,000 pounds of food a day. <laughs> it's just a lot. hard to imagine. But they're doing that for four months, five months of the year, packing on all this fat and then swimming to the tropical regions, right? And it's the Antarctic whales that I've spent the most time with, they're traveling up to uh, northern Peru, Ecuador, um, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica. Our whales in California, they're swimming down to Mexico, Central America. They overlap a little bit um, in, in space, not so much in time, but they're literally actually bringing energy to those places. And it's been figured out that those whales coming to Hawaii, say. Right. From Alaska. The whale coming to Hawaii from Alaska or from Russia or from Canada, not so much from California, different different populations. Those whales are actually bringing energy with them. Hmm. And it turns out that they are bringing as much nutrients hmm. as, say, erosion from the... So, so, you know, the ocean gets nutrients from various sources, right? Ocean water does not itself have a source of nutrients. It gets it from other sources like erosion bringing minerals into the sea. And for things to grow, algae to grow that the turtles feed on, they right. need those nutrients there. Yeah. Where does that come from? Well, around Hawaii, some of it will come from rivers washing out into the sea, that beautiful fertile soil that's eroding off of fertile Kauai that brings nutrients out into and feeds the coral reefs and feeds the algae growth and all that that the turtles feed on. Turns out that whales bring as much nutrients there as the local islands erosions do. So it's like they are really important to the health of the sea there. Yeah. And what we know now in Antarctica is that when the whales disappeared, instead of their food actually increasing because there weren't whales to eat them, their food decreased because the nutrients, the whales ate the krill in particular, which are like little shrimp that swim around in gajillions of them, hundreds and hundreds of millions of them, swim around, the whales eat them, the whales poop, and we get to a scientist talk about how valuable poop it's is all about to the, the poop. ocean. <laughs> I'm a horse girl, I get that. Mm, <laughs> that poop is available. It's available nutrients that then feeds the plankton, which right. is little free swimming algae 
that takes in the sunlight and in the Antarctic summer the sun is on the ocean 20-24 hours a day depending on where you are lots of sunlight and the algae grows and feeds the krill which feeds the whale so it's like this happy circular ecosystem but then when the whales were gone nothing ate the krill so then they died and they fell to the ocean bottom ah. and then nutrients were gone and not available right. so then there was less phytoplankton so then there was less krill we need the whale mm. and this is like here we are talking about like oh my gosh climate change well it turns out that among other things that cycle actually absorbs a lot of carbon from the atmosphere so they actually mm. keep the climate healthier too well that's good to know save the whales yeah thank you for sharing that i didn't know some of that also i just want to mention there's a very thick resource section in the back of this book that talks about whale songs and migration and um, other things we won't have enough time to cover all those amazing facts but check out the book because there's That's a lifetime of learning in there he helped me edit it so it's, it's very good <laughs> um let's see the next question is what is your most amazing moment with whales he leads well he's led trips swimming with whales so i had the fortunate experience of swimming with whales recently not with him but in another trip in tahiti which was phenomenal so. you've had all these amazing experiences with whales what is your most stellar one you can think of you know i'm gonna talk about as much as swimming with whales i mean there's there's so many there's so many and I, i'm i'm incredibly fortunate to have spent you know many 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 days of my life just right among whales and they're coming up around me or in the water around whales and mothers and calves and oh my gosh so beautiful but um i'm thinking actually of an experience in antarctica and um well we'll pull up the video so maybe you can play it here I was actually out with it was on a science voyage where we had some some guests tourists travelers and then another boat that was doing research and the research boat my um my colleague and friend logan um was taking genetic samples of the whale so they bounce a little dart off the whale's back and it takes a little bit of skin and they get the genetics from that and he he basically did this and the whale kind of jumped a little bit because like, oh, what was that be kind of like a mosquito bite and then it cruised over to our boat and we're in this tiny little zodiac this little boat this maybe oh 14 feet long 10 feet long 12 i think it's about a 12 foot long boat so the whale is literally three times the length of our boat right and it just came over and came up right next to us mm. and it was oh, the moment it it kind of just stopped and came up and breathed a few times and in a way i think what was so special about it was here we all were and we were having a lovely time it's a beautiful day and we're talking and chatting and then and but then this whale's there and everyone was just speechless and the whale's blow is like i mean it's like a fire hydrant exploding <laughs> so literally air coming out at 200 miles an hour and we were all just I don't know, it's just this magical moment of this massive creature coming up right alongside of us 
and he's hanging out for a minute. Did and you see then, his eye? Was he looking at you? Um, I don't think we saw the whale's eye, but up alongside the boat, I've had other experiences. Um, when one day we, we had, this was uh, the year before actually, we had a whale that, there were two of them and they were kind of playing with their boats. And one would come up alongside and actually bump the boat a couple of times and the other one would spy hop, which is when they sort of stand up straight and their nose comes out of the water and their eyes about probably 10 feet back from the, you know, so here's the nose of the whale up there and the eyes down at the water line. Oh uh, but this one time, I don't know, you know, it was just, it was just such a private moment myself and mm. six of, you know, six friends, travelers, and we're all just silent until the whale kind of arched her, his or her back and, and, and swam away. And, um, and, you know, at that point, the energy just kind of broke and I, I burst out laughing because it was kind of just this like so much such an intense thing what how do you even respond to that and, right oh it's just it's, yeah it's really incredible swam off and mm. and that was that you know the whale was undisturbed and beautiful day lovely yeah, visit beautiful can't experience. wait to see the footage yeah that. yeah it's a neat one we grew up doing whale watching trips in the monterey bay area because our parents would lead whale watching trips we were young kids freezing cold and throwing up on the back of the boat, but it was lovely. We, we would sometimes see whales breaching, that's when they jump out of the water. And... So yeah, lots of good childhood memories of that. Yeah. Um, could you please speak about what some of the dangers whales are facing now? Yeah. I know you were mentioning that whaling is not such an issue, but what are dangers they face now? Yeah, a lot of people will say, but oh, isn't there still whaling? And yes, there is. It's not the major threat to whales now. I am definitely against commercial whaling. There's still a couple of nations doing commercial whaling, but it's the numbers are pretty small. And the species that are hunt, hunt that they hunt they're beautiful. They are species that aren't so much at risk. So I'm against that. But the real threat to whaling, well, there's really three threats to whaling now. Uh, two, sorry, three threats to whales now. Oh, sorry, let me make that four. <laughs> um, to humpbacks that I study, the main threats, as we see it, are um, ship strikes. Literally, get hit by ships mm -hmm. because we have urbanized the ocean. We've turned the ocean into freeways. And there's, you know, everything, this phone that's recording this video came on a ship. True. We, we use ships. So we have to learn how to make our use of the ocean compatible with the whales. Ships entanglement with fishing gear. And that's mostly entanglement in pot fishing gear, like for lobsters and crabs, where you have a trap and a line and a buoy. And that line is kind of like a whale trap. Right, right. So there's whales, ways to make that safer for the whales. Um, and there's been a lot of work on this. And this will, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a tough one. Um, and then the last one, the biggest one, as far as that goes for humpback whales, is, um, is, is climate change. And that's really the huge thing. I mean, when actually in my research, we've seen a major change in the population of humpback whales that migrate to Hawaii because of a marine heat wave, essentially as a result of climate change, right. that swept across and sat in the Gulf of Alaska and off the coast of Alaska. It actually stretched all the way down to here for two years, a marine heat wave. Like we think of a heat wave as like, oh, that was a hot weekend. Or, oh, that was a hot week. This is like years of warm water, right. which meant less food. And it's food that is really the biggest thing for them. And I said, let me change that to four because for humpback whales, plastic in the ocean, the focus of your book, right. it's not, so, well, 
we don't know that it's that much of an issue yet. They are eating a lot of plastic, but we are not sure if that's really harming them. Mm -hmm. For other species, sperm whales being one of them, the way that they eat, they humpback whales filter feed, so they get lots of little pieces of plastic. Right. But sperm whales, they'll eat specific items and some things like the stuff that the whale that you spoke about that washed up on shore. Have belly full of plastic. Yeah. But it's starved. You know, it's like starving with a full belly. And that's the case for sperm whales and quite a few other species of tooth whales, whales that don't filter feed, but they eat individual um fish or squid or other kinds of things so yeah those are those are the big threats all of them are things that we can change mm -hmm. we just have to recognize it yeah you know? and that's why it's important to share about this because a lot of people don't know the ocean's such a magnificent force and we all love it but we don't really understand what's happening in it so yeah. it's important to share this with people and how do you i mean the biggest thing to me is climate change and how do you address that well we can't do it alone but i think that's the thing you know if the ocean has the ocean has many lessons for us but one of them to me is like if you care about it well you can't work at it alone right you right. We gotta work together and that means not just us individually but you know, the town has to organize beach cleanups. Yeah. The state has to have policies that, that encourage renewable energy. The governments, the federal governments and the world governments need to enact legislation and rules that say, look, we're, we are transitioning. We can't keep burning oil because this is essentially heating up the ocean and heat in the ocean ends up being like poison for the ocean. It's just less, it, 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 it'd be like, you know, walking into a lovely farm and, and saying, well, that's beautiful, but let's set fire to it. Oh gosh, the crops don't grow as well when they're burnt. Right, Go right. figure, you know, yeah, yeah. And the heated oceans also impact all the other creatures that we talked about in the book, the coral reefs. Big time. All the creatures. It's Huge not just thing. the whales, obviously. We spoke a little bit about mom and dad, and um, they were obviously environmental activists. I was curious how they impacted you with your mm. fervor for environmental conservation and the work you're doing now. Yeah. I mean, you know... I, I took to it early on running around in the woods and learning about these creatures. But I think a lot of it, you know, they love to share. Dad was a natural teacher and his enthusiasm for teaching was huge. And there's nothing that turned him on more than seeing people inspired by the beauty of nature and I, I i certainly learned that we're very different people i'm much more like mom who was quiet in her nature but i also learned like look you gotta we 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 have to share this we have to see it we have to you know the beauty and we've been incredibly fortunate to not everyone can gallivant off and go swim with whales and be among, you know, whale watching is fairly accessible. If you live or can travel to a coastline, there's whales and dolphins in almost every body of ocean and whale watching companies and can be expensive, but a day trip, usually not so expensive. Many people get seasick. Okay. Kind of navigate there's ways that to work around that. It's a tough one. There's medicine for that. There's <laughs> solutions. Anyway, yeah, I think for me it was it was really learning like, hey, you know, I've got my comfort zone, but if I want to get to this place, I want people to recognize that we need to act of ourselves and we need to express our caring for the ocean in order to, you know, make it be the healthy place that it can be. We often need to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. For me, oftentimes that is getting in front of people and saying, look, you know, this is important. 
and and sharing it and finding ways to creatively share it. I mean, to me, that's what Happy Well is, is trying to find a creative way to make learning about the ocean accessible. Right. Beautiful. Love that. You're carrying the torch. <laughs> and then since they're passing, mom passed in November 2022, our dad... 21. Oh, sorry, 21, thank you. I knew that. <laughs> uh, and our dad passed four months afterwards in March 2022, got that date right. But I know their passing has impacted me in a powerful way and yeah. impacted me to write this book and to step up more for wild horse conservation work that I do also. But has their passing impacted you to put this message out on a larger scale? Yeah. Um... You know, it was a lot of fun to share this with them. They uh, they were very supportive of mm -hmm. me um, developing this, you know, exploring my passion. And, and gosh, when we cleaned out their house, you know, I'd find printed news clippings and the research papers that I was involved in scattered all over, <laughs> literally in piles. Oh, look, here's a paper in there. It was, um, yeah, um, you know, their support, I think, gave, was a big part of the confidence that I've been able to bring into this. And them being gone, I, I mean, honestly, it's just, it's just made it more, um, you know, it's really added to my motivation that this is mm -hmm. finding my purpose and and pursuing that rather than, you know, thinking about my purpose and then and then doing something else. But you know, really just pursuing my purpose, I think, has been a lot of the impact of their right. their um, yeah their passing and yeah yeah you know and I I I used to always um, I would send them a little, you know, note every time I published a paper or something, hey, look at this. And now, so it's one of these things, like when, when, when I receive news that a publication has been accepted, it's like, oh, can't send that to them anymore. But, send it um, to me. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, it's been quite motivating. Um, so yeah. Seems like when, our beloved's past, it just reminds us what's important and yeah. often could have us put our heart into what is meaningful. That's my experience. Well, I know they're shining down and even very proud of you for everything you're doing. Um, is there anything else you would like to share as far as your love and passion of the whales and to help inspire people who may not have access to the ocean or they may look at it and it's just this strange unknown factor something that can help them understand the beauty of it yeah well the reality is that you know we will protect what we love and i think it's easy to think of like whales are beautiful but they're far away you know and they're they're really not. I mean, we share this space with them, right? You know, and if you've swam in the ocean, you've 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 shared the waters with whales and dolphins and all the earth creatures. I mean, to me, you know, the reason I, I said that most large whale populations have been recovering or are recovered, you know, we almost drove many species to extinction, but we didn't, not quite. And then we stopped killing them and we gave them space. And that, you know, the reality is, well, how did we do that? We passed laws. We, we decided as a society that they are valuable and that they are meaningful, that they should exist. That is a decision that we make every generation, every time we vote, mm -hmm. every time we shop for seafood, every time we think about you know, how do you dispose of a piece of plastic? Do you recycle all the things that you talk about in your book? That is not a, our forefathers made these decisions. That's not, oh yes, society was so wise as to ban whaling in 1986. 
It was, it is a decision that we continue to make. And if we stop making that decision, mm -hmm. it goes the other way. And so to me, it's like, it's, it, this is, you know, we have seen that the oceans can return to health if we care about them. Right. And we have to never stop caring. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we all can make a difference. You are not powerless. This book also talks about ways to make a difference too. Um, one more question I just thought up actually. Um, a lot of people say that whales are highly evolved beings. You mm -hmm. know, the sperm whale, this one here, has the largest brain. Um, and since these creatures are deep in the ocean, they're not something we can go up and visit, say like a horse, so they dive down. And anyway, they're in, there's things known about them, but there's also a lot of mysteries about them. Do you think they are highly evolved beings? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, they're, Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, mm -hmm. the sperm whale, we have these lovely little eight pound brains, right? That whale's brain is 22 pounds. Like they're huge, right? Now the whale is much larger. Can it do calculus like we do? Probably not. Very different. They don't use tools quite so. Actually, humpback whales use bubbles as tools. Right. They need stuff. They are highly evolved. They're clearly highly intelligent. Their intelligence is very different from ours. Yeah. Very different from ours. Sperm whales see with sound, as do basically all, all toothed whales. Use echolocation. So they can actually communicate with sound. They can see with sound. And so, for all we know, you know, they can, there, there's some mixing of that, actually, like communication through imagery, potentially. We, we right. don't know, and there's an effort to try to understand, decipher well language, and I use quotes because even using the term language might not be appropriate, mm. but they are, humpback whales have the most complex songs of any creature in the, in, in the animal kingdom as complex as our operas. They have multiple levels of complexity, and you, you know, you actually have to like speed up a humpback whale's song to be able to hear the structures in it. Mm. But they have this incredibly complex song. We don't even know why they sing. We know it has to do with their breeding behavior, but it's not like, hey ladies, and it's not like, hey guys, I'm here. You know, it's, it's and uh, you know, it's, it's something different. We don't know. Right, right. And they communicate their songs. They learn songs from each other. They, they're, 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 they're passed on culturally. These animals have culture, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, there there's a lot of complexity. They have societies. They have, you know, learning across individuals, and they're they're they're. I I I really hesitate to say that they're as smart as smarter than not as smart as their intelligence is very different from ours. Right. But boy, they're very evolved, and um, and yeah, humpback whales are all kind of pretty alien, and they live in a very alien environment. I mean, imagine this. Yes. I mean, they're finding they're finding food that's like like you know, fist sized squid, two three thousand feet deep in the ocean, just one by one in the dark, and then coming back to the surface, and and they you know they. Sperm whales take turns. Mothers and sisters will babysit for each other so that mom can go down and feed while baby's hanging out at the surface before baby's old enough to be diving on, mm. on baby's own when it's potentially vulnerable to predation from killer whales and such. And you know, they, they have aunties and family relationships and, and, and honestly, they actually have stronger family bonds than we do. Sperm whales do, killer whales do. They, mm. Male sperm, male killer whales will stay with their moms their entire lives. You know, stronger family ties than we do. Right. And what do we think of as signs of intelligence? We think of emotional connection as mm. signs of, of humanity. Well, right. They have that. Yeah. They have that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. There's a lot of beauty there. Just have to look under the surface. Well, also too, you think that we almost, like you said, annihilated them with whaling and the fact that they are still so loving and caring to us and 
you know, whales can, I was swimming with them and I knew that they could jump on top of me if they wanted to, but they are so peaceful and yeah. I, you know, there was not a worry about that at all. So the fact that they can forgive us for everything we've done is, shows a lot of emotional intelligence, I think. Yeah. So, um, well, any last parting words and also, I know this is two part sentence, but if you could let people know, and I'll put all this information in the video in the comments, but how can people, um, find happy well, happy well is easy to find happy um, and if you, you know, anyone who has, uh, any photos of whales, a diving humpback whale, or maybe killer whales swimming along. We use different parts of different species to identify an individual. Um, usually it takes a better camera than say a mobile phone, but you know, some, excuse me, sometimes, sometimes mobile phone photos work when the whale's diving with tail lifts, excuse me. Um, so yeah, go to Happy Whale, upload your photos or just poke around and you can sign up for an account and follow some of the whales and we're working on kind of better interpretive materials there. But, um, yeah, it's, um, I think learning about these creatures, you know, you can't help but realize that there's a lot of beauty there and that's, it's a worthy thing. Thank you for, thank you for doing this incredible work. I'm so mm -hmm. grateful. They're also on Facebook and Instagram as well. So follow their social media pages and please tell your friends about it. So thank you so much for taking time to talk. It's such an honor to speak with my beautiful, amazing, intelligent brother. And um, thanks. yes, check out the whales. Happy days. Yay, whales. All right. And check out the book too. It's on Amazon, Kaimana, the Hawaiian mermaid. All right. Aloha.